Hello everybody, it is Tanya Williams here, author of A Child Free Happily Ever After and founder of Child Free Magazine and I am really excited to be talking to the amazing Therese Schechter who is a documentary filmmaker. Now if you, know, if you don't know about Therese then you should, she's about to launch an amazing documentary called My, 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 My So-Called Selfish Life. So uh, we're very excited then. We're, we're sitting waiting for this to come out. So um, yeah, make sure you, you follow her channels and um, keep updated on when that's about to happen. But Therese also wrote a fantastic article for Child Free Magazine uh, around our bodies and our choice um, and our rights as women. And I think this is a really important conversation. It's a very big topic. Um, we're going to dive into it a little bit um, today and talk a bit more about it, what it means, what what um, what this means for, for people all around the world. So, um, Therese, would you like to tell people a little bit more about yourself and a little bit more about the article that you've written? Sure. So, um, I am a documentary filmmaker. As Tanya said, I'm based in Brooklyn, New York. I'm actually representing with my Brooklyn earrings here. Um, and uh, I'm working on this film, My So-Called Selfish Life. I've been making documentaries for 20 years now, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but I like to make films that really challenge the things that we hold sacred about womanhood. So I've made films about virginity and just the idea of female power and bodies and this is pretty much the most sacred thing that I'm trying to <laughs> disrupt, which is motherhood. So the, the film really looks at um, what it means to say no to motherhood in a culture that expects everyone to want children and have children, and what it means when you can't actually control your own reproductive life. Um, and, uh, and that was the um, jumping off point for the piece that I wrote for the magazine also. Um, but the movie's funny. <laughs> it's very entertaining. We've just finished doing 24 different animated clips for the film. There's a lot of very cool animation in it. Um, and I believe that this film is going to be interesting, not just for the child-free community, but for lots of other people as well. And I do have a lot of supporters who are parents who are very interested in this topic and very interested in letting their kids know that there's not just one path in life, which you know makes me feel very good <laughs> about the happiness of future generations. And um, so I think it's gonna be a, a, a wider um, group that's gonna be interested in this film, which is cool. I'm very happy about that. And I think it should be a wider group that um, is part of this conversation. I've been on a, a couple of clubhouse, um, you know, clubhouses and, and this whole thing about parents being involved in this conversation is coming up time and time again, because I think it's really important that um, mothers are giving their daughters and their sons permission to choose um, and mm -hmm. not just saying, oh, when you're a mother, when you're, it could be, well, if you become a mum, one day or a dad one day and and letting them know that it's okay to have a choice around what they do with their bodies so i think that dialogue very much needs to change from parents to the next generation and i think that's why it's important for them to see these types of films and read these articles to get a greater understanding of the impact that it has on their the you know their, their children's lives but and also the impact it has on society mm -hmm. very much so and i'm going to take that even one step further and say that when I'm talking to parents about this film, they say to me, oh, you know, we decided we only wanted one child and people are driving us crazy, asking when we're gonna have another one mm -hmm. and telling us that our kid is gonna be messed up if they don't have a sibling and things like that, which is one of the oldest tricks in the book in pronatalism. But um, yeah, so I think that, that parents feel that, that same kind of pressure in a slightly different way, but yeah. The pronatalist pressure, the pressure to have children, the insistence on having children is not just being exerted on the child free, but also on people with children to have more. Yeah. But that's then you have too much and then people get mad at you about that. So yeah, well, that's, there's no that's, winning. That's right. it, it doesn't matter what choice we make, whether it's to not have children, whether it's to have one child, even if it's to have five children, then it's like, well, that's too many. You've gone too far. You know, so if right. you want to have a judgment 
about everything that goes on, which everything. I don't really understand because I go, well, how does my choice to not have children impact your life in any way, shape, or form? It doesn't. So, mm-hmm. It but doesn't. Society for you. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. So, shout out to to the parents who, uh, you know, have supported the film, who are part of our social media communities and contribute a lot of cool stuff. Um, I'm really happy to have them there. This is not always a popular opinion among the child-free community, but you know, my house, my rules. Yeah. <laughs> you all can do whatever you want with your well, I, I think with your houses. It's great to have them as part of the conversation. I think as long as there's respect on both sides to each other's mm-hmm. choices, then yeah. it's really important to open up this conversation. And it doesn't have to be this big divide of you're child free, or you're a parent, you go over in that corner, I go over in mine. I think it's it's really important to have you know, group conversations and discussion and be part of the same thing. I don't think it necessarily has to be one side versus the other. No, we're all actually fighting the same side of this. In yeah, fact. yeah. So let's um, let's really dive into the, the topic of choice um, and women having a choice about what they do with their own bodies. Now, I am very much pro-choice. I have always been pro-choice I strongly believe that all women should be able to make a choice about what is right for their life and their body drives me crazy the fact that there are so many men in power who have been able to tell women what they can do and I know it's not just men but it tends to be you know white male middle class you know men that are making these rules and and it, it actually makes me very angry that that has been the case and it still is the case to this day what do you say to people who openly criticize the pe- women having the right to choose what they do with their own body so it kind of depends on who that person is mm-hmm. is it you know my uncle <laughs> who has different views that i do on things my uh, imaginary uncle or is it the guy outside the abortion clinic where I'm helping escort people in who may be carrying a gun (laughs) so that conversation really varies depending on who I'm talking to Um, and I just wanted to say one thing before we really got into it which is um, I'm going to use the word woman a lot as sort of a sociological term that um, defines a class of people that have been um, subjugated, marginalized uh, because they're women and also the ones who get the most pressure. And that's a, that's a like, historical sociological idea of women. Yeah. But I also recognize that when we're talking about reproductive rights, we're talking about uteruses and fallopian tubes and ovaries and not every woman has um, that anatomy um trans women do not have that anatomy yeah. uh, and there are many trans men who do have the anatomy so um i just want to make this an inclusive conversation of recognize yeah, that sure. um yeah. uterus havers come in many different forms and um, i agree the, uh, the term woman is probably because we think we we put having children and women naturally together but i totally agree and i'm on the same page with you that yeah 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 i mean we do i mean that's the thing yeah. like to be a yeah. woman is to be a mother yeah. so in that sense there is a, a very very strong idea of what woman means so yeah, yeah. um yeah, definitely so yeah what do i say? it really depends so who am i talking to tanya who's saying that to me well i would say go from both extremes and if, if it is someone that you know that's that's openly criticizing so is your your, your your parent, your uncle, your brother, like well, your, your, your mother, whoever, or it is a stranger, you know, that, that you don't know that is outside an abortion clinic. I mean, what is what do those conversations look like or what, you know, tell me more about that. Um, you know, the conversations can be um, difficult. I think that that the, the first question I would want to know is, is this something that you personally wouldn't do or is it something that you don't want anyone to do? That's the first thing, because if you're making um, a personal decision to, if you got pregnant, for example, you you would not have an abortion, you would carry the child, carry the baby. Um, That's cool. That's your view. Do you want to legislate to make sure no one else can make that decision? Uh, That's not cool. 
So I think that's the first, the first thing is if people want to decide about their own lives, that's what this is all about. You, you make decisions for your life, your own life. That's a very good Um, distinction. I think that's a great place to start. Yeah. Um, but if, if you have decided that what you want is what everyone else has to do, it's oppression. (laughs) Um, so that's a problem. I think if we're talking about sort of larger groups of people, um, as a, as a, as a group, the, um, anti-choice group, I think that what you will find if you just scratch the surface is it's not that they're opposed to abortion because they're also in many ways opposed to contraception. They're opposed to sex outside of heterosexual marriage. These things all go hand in hand. Um, and so it's not really, I mean, people are going to talk a really good game about life and, you know, life starts at conception and all of these things that, you know, you can talk about science, but it's not going to get you anywhere. Um, what they really believe in is controlling women's bodies. I mean, ultimately, when you add up all of the things that they're against, they're against bodily autonomy. They are against women being able to make choices about their own bodies. Mm -hmm. They are against women who have sex outside of marriage, um, being able to have an abortion if they want to terminate the pregnancy. They believe that if you have sex outside of marriage and get pregnant, you should be punished for it Mm -hmm. by carrying the baby, um, birthing the baby. So, I think this is a really good thing to keep in mind that ultimately, ultimately it's not about abortion and it's not about life starting at conception. I mean, it's a great branding effort on their part. Um, but it's, it's really about needing to control women's bodies yeah. and preventing women from um, making the decisions that are right for them and preventing them from accessing services. if. Um, I mean, that's been going on for a long time. And, and of course, all of this is exacerbated if, if you're a woman of color, if you're uh, not wealthy, <laughs> if you're uh, working class, if you're in poverty, um, all of these things make it much, much harder because of the series of laws and restrictions that have been put into place by this same group of people who don't think you should be able to have any bodily autonomy. So I don't think I could have that conversation for very long. (laughs) Um, I, I, you know, there's just this sort of level of, I will, uh, I cannot support you if your goal is to oppress me. I can't like, yeah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be having coffee with you. Yeah. You know, if that's, I'm, I'm, if what I'm surprised about given that it is about controlling women's bodies is that there are so many women that, that, that say that's okay. Cause it's not just men, you know, that are standing up. Absolutely. And saying, but there's all these women and, and it's just like, okay, so are you being controlled by the man and they're telling you what to do? Or is this actually something that you think that, that no woman, including yourself, should have a right to actually do what is right for her. So it always surprises me when women are actually against it as well. Cause I'm just like, this is actually something that you should have as a right, as a, as a, as a person. So I don't know. I just, I struggle with that. Well, that makes sense. You know, some people are just deeply religious and their uh, faith practice uh, basically tells them that it's a sin and they can't have abortions. And so whatever you think about that, that is one big um, part of it. Um, if you want to stay within your religion um, and you want to be respected by your community, that all thinks this way. I think you know, they, but they I think, pick and choose what they actually stick to, though. There's a lot of uh, hypocrites. Well, I was, I was that, going that to say. Space, we won't go too, too far down that space. But, you know, I think they, they tend to choose what they like to uh, believe in and what they'll, uh, yeah. Not. I think that's true. And I also think, and knowing people who have worked at abortion clinics um, or who have worked with abortion clinics, the person that is protesting in front of the clinic one day is bringing their daughter in the next day. This is really common. 
this happens all the time. So it's basically, these are the rules, except when it applies to me. What so that, that's, I mean, and that's a, it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, you know, because, because abortion is healthcare. It's important healthcare. All of these forms of reproductive healthcare are important. And they know it's important because they, <laughs> they want to take care of their pregnant daughters, but they don't want anyone else to be able to do that. And they so, probably don't want anyone else to know about that either. So therefore it's all yeah, really but hush -hush. Yeah. everyone in the clinic <laughs> knows about it. Um, the other problem is, as long as we're talking about abortion, is that it has for so long been shrouded in shame and secrecy and stigma, and you're not supposed to talk about it, and you're supposed to be ashamed about it. Yeah. And that is really changing. And once people are empowered to talk about these things, to tell their own stories, to say, yeah, I had an abortion, it's the best thing I ever did. And as a matter of fact, on our Facebook page today, um, we post these like happy birthday to it's women without children. And today it was Jamila Jamil, Jamila Jamil. <laughs> and um, she was on The Good Place, if anyone is a Good Place fan. And she's been very outspoken about the fact that she had an abortion when she was younger and it was the best choice she ever made. And just like that, the very first comment was, um, you know, I get why someone would want an abortion, but you know, it's, it's a bad thing to do and you should be ashamed of it. You shouldn't brag about it. It shows that you had poor planning. Oh my God. So, so somebody wrote that and you know, I wonder if they would, they would say that to the person's face if they weren't sitting behind a computer screen. I think they would actually, okay. I do. I think they would. Um, but anyway, um, in this, this is an instance where I, I don't think yeah. the, that it's the computer screen. But what happened was 24 comments all in a row, one after the other, um, responding to her. And a lot of the comments were like, hey, guess what? I had an abortion. I'm not ashamed. It was the best choice I ever made. Contraception is never 100% effective. Yeah. Exactly. It doesn't matter how, how who, much. Who are you to, who are, you know, yeah. abortion is a plan. It is a plan. It is the plan that you have when you get pregnant without intending to, and you don't want to have a child. Yeah. That's the plan. The plan is you get an abortion. So, um, so it was really, it was really kind of amazing to see all of these people come in and a couple of people were kind of rude, violated our <laughs> community standards and had to, get them. yeah. Yeah. But, um, but for the most part, people were just very matter of fact about it. Yeah. And, um, it was really, really interesting to see all of these people come together and not just, not just say, Oh, you're an anti-choice fanatic, whatever, but to say, Oh no, I had one and I feel very good about being able to do that. And I think that this is this generation, let's say this is a, a, a new era in talking about these kinds of things. And, and there, I, I want to plug um, an organization called Shout Your Abortion. Shout Your Abortion is on all social media and they collect stories from people and they're amazing, heartfelt, uh, deep stories of people who have had abortions. And uh, there's, shouting their abortion basically um that's fantastic and, it opens up the dialogue and it allows people to have to share their stories and have a conversation and, and to stop the shame and to stop all that and go it's okay i've done it and i'm a normal person and and i love i'm a normal when person. people have yeah you know initiatives like that i just think that's fantastic it is really great so i encourage people to check out shout your abortion on social media and every once in a while they have uh a, a story from a child-free person, which I like to um, then repost on our social media. Um, I like highlighting Shout Your Abortion and the work they do, but I also like highlighting, normalizing the idea that when you're child-free, abortion is a really, really important part of your health care. Yeah. It just is. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. Okay. So there you go. <laughs> I have solved all the world's problems. <laughs>
as you always do. <laughs> I, I, I do. I do want to also say that there are people working very, very hard out there to um, help us be able to control our bodies and control our lives. There are people who are working in clinics. There are people who are um, doctors. There are people who are supporting uh, these clinics uh, all over the U.S. with their money. Um, I, I want to plug the National Network of Abortion Funds. Uh, people like to give to Planned Parenthood, but I would like to put in a word for the National Network of Abortion Funds because their money goes directly to clinics, directly. And um, the people who are most impacted by these heinous laws and restrictions are people who can't afford to travel to the one clinic in their state. They can't afford to take two days off of work because they'll be fired. They can't afford to be in a hotel overnight uh, getting their procedure done. They can't afford any of these things. And what happens is either they don't get an abortion and they have a child. Which ends which up is, costing them more anyway because they've got a child to raise. Yeah. Another, an, a child to raise or another child to raise. Um, or they end up trying to get a second trimester abortion because it has taken them so long to pull together the resources they need. They're now in their second trimester, more expensive, harder to get, less clinics doing it. So, um, um, yeah, I, and I can't even imagine being in a situation like that where your choice is taken away from you due to circumstance. I really like to remind people that although abortion is 100% legal in the United States, Roe v. Wade stands, it has not been overturned, it is 100% legal. Yeah. It is very hard to get an abortion in many parts of this country, especially if you're not wealthy. And that's, uh, that is a surprise. I know when you first told me that I was very surprised by that because you just assume that, oh, it's the US, of course, you know, it's legal, you're going to be able to go anywhere and get it so you have this assumption of well because it's legal it must be you know relatively easy to get yeah how has um the death of um the fantastic you know ruth bader ginsburg impacted all this i know there's been lots of conversation when she passed about um is it amy coney um, i don't even know the proper name amy, amy coney barrett. barrett we don't hear much about her over here <clears> so <throat> i don't know a lot about her but her trying to overturn things and there's all this controversy what does all that mean? Like for people who are outside of the US and don't really know a lot about it and what it all means for not just the US, but is that going to have a flow on impact in other parts of the world as well if, if there are changes made here? Yeah, I mean, American reproductive policy does affect other parts of the world because the US is a, a major funder um, for um, nonprofits and non-government organizations all over the world. And... Um, so what happens is if we get a conservative government, they uh, then enact this, this uh, rule that organizations can't get American funding if they talk about abortion with their folks, or even if they, they're giving out contraception. Like the, it's a global gag order, it's sometimes called. Um, and so what happens is then when we get a Democrat as a president, the first thing they do is lift that so that people can once again talk about, you know, healthy family planning and contraception and abortion and everything that, that it takes to have reproductive, good reproductive health care, they can talk about it again. So um, I think what happens in the U.S. is, is really um important in the rest of the world in that sense, because the US gives so much money to so many organizations, it gives them a lot of power to withhold that money. Um, well, Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, is um, a hero to so many of us, um, because she's a brilliant legal mind, but she also has been fighting her whole life for uh, the rights of women in many different dimensions. Um, we knew she wasn't immortal, unfortunately, yeah. but the problem is because our Supreme Court system is kind of fucked up, whoever, whoever happens <laughs> to be what president, you really <laughs> I mean, think about it. Whoever happens yeah. to be president when a Supreme Court justice either retires or dies gets to put the next one in. 
gets yeah. to pick who the next one yeah. is. It seems a bit ridiculous that that can happen. It's ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. And um, our former president uh, got to seat three Supreme Court justices, including Amy Coney Barrett when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. So it has skewed the Supreme Court to be extremely conservative. Now it's six to three in terms of how people usually vote on these kinds of issues, um, which means a lot of things are ripe for overturning, but we don't really know what's gonna happen. It's, it's still a big question mark. There are some people who are like, yep, this is it. We need to change our entire reproductive health strategy um, because of this, because this is gonna happen, life after row. Um, so, it's, it's a big deal. It's not just a big deal for reproductive health care, though. It's a big deal for a lot of things um, that are going to be challenged in court and come up for a vote. Yeah. So it's not good. <laughs> but the last four years have been not good. And I'll tell you, the last 200 years have been not good either. So we're constantly yeah. fighting these battles. I feel like the women's movement and, you know, like feminism and, you know, all that sort of stuff, we go three paces forward and then four paces back. And it's like we, we, we make some forward movement and some really positive stuff happens and then something happens and then it sort of goes a little bit backward. It feels like that constant, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, crap, this has happened. Oh, this is something good. Uh, I, I don't know, it just feels that way. And I don't, uh, I, I feel like you start to get all this forward momentum and movement and all this great stuff happening mm -hmm. and then President It's Trump not just feminism. It. Something I mean happens and it just pushes us back. Yeah, it's not just feminism, it's well, all social justice movements yeah, exactly. go forward and then are, then get a backlash and then try to move forward again and get a backlash, yeah. civil rights movement, you know, the same thing. Um, even under Trump, all of the gains that have, have been made by um, LGBTQ uh, activism, and especially for trans folks and trans folks serving the military, um, all of that got rolled back under Trump. And now they have to start reinstating again that yeah. trans folks can serve in the military, for example. So it's just this constant, constant push because it is so profound to challenge the status quo. It is a profound thing to go up against these entrenched, powerful, backed by a lot of money folks who have been setting the rules and setting things up for a long time. Yeah. And to push against that, sometimes I think every victory is a miracle. Yeah. But, you know, um, we don't have child labor anymore. <laughs> no one is no one is yeah. going to burn me as a witch because I'm making this movie. So these are all good things <laughs> if you want to think about the long arc of history. Yeah. Um, but I think the other thing is that we have short memories. And I think that generations who have really benefited from gains in social justice become comfortable. And they don't, they don't have that memory or they don't have the, the feeling of what it was like before and why you have to keep always trying to push forward. And I think not enough people vote. I mean, if you're not showing up to vote, then however you feel, yeah. You know, some people think that their vote doesn't count. It's hard to vote for a lot of people. People of color have been shut out of the voting process since they were given the right to vote, since they won the right to vote. Um, there are a lot of roadblocks. I think what happened in Georgia, I don't know if you all are following what, what was going on in Georgia, but Georgia has been a Republican state for a very, very long time, um, run by... Uh, white politicians, white Christian politicians, um, very much the status quo. And over the last 10 years, there have been these initiatives to register as many voters as possible in Georgia. Stacey Abrams uh, led this along with a lot of very hardworking black women and everyone else in Georgia who was out on the streets registering voters. And it took a long time. It's like, it was like a 10 year process to get as many people as possible registered. Because we're in the majority, we, we are, um, but not enough people vote. And what happened, Georgia turned blue. So our two senators from Georgia now um, are both Democrats. 
One is um, a black man and one is a white Jewish man. So both of those are, are like, yeah, <laughs> take that, yeah. Georgia. You know, so it, so that that was pretty pretty great. And that's because of people's very hard work. It didn't just happen. I, I still, it's, a, it's a lot of work. The, 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 um, the political system in, in the US always baffles me, the fact that it's not compulsory to vote. Mm -hmm. still does my mind. I, could, I still can't understand that because here, once you turn 18, you have to register to vote and you have to vote, otherwise you get fined. So it's just part of our you know, upbringing that you, and, you know, typically you're excited. Well, I remember I being excited to go, oh my God, I actually have, I have, I get to have a say in, in what's happening. Um, yeah. And, you know, you're like, you want to have a vote. You want to be part of changing or supporting or whatever it might be, you know, when it comes to the politics of the country. So mm -hmm. I've, I've always struggled with the, U, with the US system and the fact that it's not actually compulsory in you to actually go and vote, but yet still people want to have a say but it's like, well, you can't have a say unless you have a vote and and be part of that, you know, and, and actually make change. It, it just, yeah, I actually struggle with that a little bit to think that a country like America doesn't have compulsory voting. Well, one reason for that is that if everyone voted, the Republicans would disappear. <laughs> this is true. You probably I mean, not. I actually <laughs> think that our former president said that. How will yeah. we win if all, if all these people can vote? You know, yeah. so... So, but it's not the right people to vote that will vote for us and vote us back. Yeah. Again. Yeah. I mean, it's a very concerted effort to prevent certain people from voting. And um, so absolutely, again, the, the powers that be do not want compulsory voting because they're going to vote themselves out of office. Sure. Um, it's all been about voter suppression. Honestly, we live in a really white supremacist country. And uh, when after emancipation, um, black people were given the right to vote, but they couldn't vote. They couldn't, they were prevented from voting in every possible way. Um, just as an example. Yeah. Uh, if you're a, if you're a convict and you've served your time, you often can't vote. You've been disenfranchised and you can't vote. Even though you have, you've paid your debt to society, you can't vote. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a, it's a very deliberate effort to keep the voting block a, of a, a certain kind of voter. Yeah. And that's why Georgia was so remarkable and wonderful and kind of makes perfect sense. Because if you put all of this hard work and energy and time into registering as many voters as possible, you are going to get a less conservative voting body um, and you will get Democratic senators that then turn the Senate Democratic. It doesn't just happen though. You have to work really, oh, you know, you, right. you have to work really hard. A lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of people involved in that process. Let's talk about what we can do in a in practical way. So what do we need to do as a community to force change within our own communities and our own countries to try and deal, well, change the stigma to, to make the conversation a more positive one um, and to, I suppose, get people thinking about the idea that everyone should be able to have a choice about what they do with their own body. Like, what are some of the practical mm -hmm. things that we can all put in place wherever we are in the world uh, to actually have a really positive impact in the right direction on this? Um, you have to vote. Yep. Um, and if you can't vote, then um, we have to all support voting rights actions. You have to think beyond your own reproductive system. And I think that's really important. I think that there are a lot of people, and I and I feel this with the child-free community, it's one of my little soapboxes, is that the child-free community, I think one of the most important things would be to be able to control your own reproduction, right? Like you would think that yeah. that would be incredibly important. Yeah. And people, people do think that's important as, as it affects them. But I find that there are a lot of people who, once they're set, like, I got mine, I'm good, mm. don't take the next step. They don't take the next step to make sure everyone else has the same, um, uh, I'm not even going to say advantages, that has the same basic rights. Yeah. So 
I think the first thing is to look beyond ourselves and to understand that we're all in this together and um, saying that you're like, I'm okay, so I'm done. Um, hey, I'm gonna use the word selfish. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. No, but I, I do I do believe that this is this is one of the most important things. Like I, I write in the article, you know, it's very annoying to get bingos thrown at you. It's very annoying to go to a baby shower and have people driving you crazy. Um, these are all very annoying things, but they're just annoying. They're not yeah. profoundly life changing in uh, terrible ways. Like yeah not having any good choices about your reproductive future. Yeah. That's a real problem. And I will say that the people around you not having those choices is also a real problem. And it really should be our shared problem, our shared issues. Yeah. I, think I think that's, that's the really first thing. Yeah, I'm, look, I was having a conversation the other day with some other child-free girls and we were talking about, um, you know, the, those of us who are quite vocal about being passionately child free and, and what that means and, and we're you know writing doing movies and writing books and doing all this stuff have a responsibility I suppose to a certain degree to stand up for those who haven't got that voice or feel like they can't say whatever they want to you know say because they're of mm -hmm. their family or their partners or society won't allow them to and there's you know I've had numbers of conversations and you probably have as well with people who are like yeah, you know, I don't want kids, but I, I, I can't say too much about it because in my country, if I say that, you know, these things can happen or my, my family will mm -hmm. disown me and all these terrible things can happen to them. So I think those of us that have got a voice should be using our voices in a positive way mm -hmm. to help everybody. So the ones that don't necessarily have a voice or can't stand up for themselves um, or too, too afraid to stand up for themselves, I think there's a wider responsibility for all of us there to go, hey, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be a filmmaker or an author or create a magazine or whatever. Mm -hmm. We can all be part of this change by being part of a real conversation, by pushing back and saying that's not okay to say that to someone, by being, you know, part of these communities and networks. And I think we can all do that and we can all take responsibility and play a part in that. Yeah, and I think that, you know, We've been talking about abortion a lot, but it's not just about abortion. It's about access to contraception. It's about access to voluntary sterilization. Yep. Um, I think having being having access to morning after pills, which are sometimes hard to get, um, making sure these things are covered under health insurance so everyone can afford to do it. Yep. Um, you know, there are a lot of aspects to this. There are a lot of barriers to. Uh, people actually even having choices to make. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I mean, what do, we, what, do we, what do we do here where I live? We give money to organizations that we think are doing good work. Um, we show up for things. We um, add our body to the crowd because of course, the more people that are there, the more people that are there. And it's like, oh, people actually care about this. We encourage our friends to come with us. Um, I can't tell you how many like first time protesters I've gone to things with <laughs> you know, because they kind of want to, but they don't, you know, they're like a little nervous and, you know, and it's like, yeah, come, just come. It's not a big deal. We're just going to take the subway. We're going to go there and stand yeah. around. Um, I think, you know, insist that your elected officials care about this shit. Make it clear that you're not going to vote for someone who's anti-choice, for example. You're not going to yeah. vote for someone who doesn't think that everyone deserves health care and this health care should be covering reproductive services. Yeah. Um, make that known. Um, register voters, run for office. <laughs> <laughs> But I think, I think that the first step is understanding that you can make a difference in other people's lives and you must make a difference in other people's lives. Yeah. Um, you know, here, here in the US, um, and I wrote about this in the article too, there's this idea about reproductive justice. So this is a, a, an expansion, a really important expansion of the idea of reproductive rights. It's reproductive rights combined with social justice. So, it's a framework that was developed by a group of black women. Sister Song is a great representation of this group. 
Um, and there are, there are three goals. One is the right to not have a child if you don't want a child. The second is the right to have a child if you want a child. And the third is to um, carry, birth, and raise your child in a safe environment. These don't seem like extraordinary things to ask for, and yet, and yet they are. Yeah. Um, and so, so I really like thinking about all of this in the framework of reproductive justice, um, because it's a more all encompassing way of looking at our reproductive lives. I think that everyone has the right to these things. So, um, you know, and again, if you're interested in reproductive justice and want to read up on it, just Google reproductive justice. It's pretty, it's pretty easy. Um, but it's, it's just a, moral responsibility to make sure that people have, have these rights. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's and, and, I, and I just like thinking about this in a broader way, because honestly, you can't make good choices if you don't have any good choices to choose from. Yeah, it's or great even to say about what choices you have, even like that's the step before, well, you know, what choices do I actually have to be able to make a choice that may be right for me? Yeah, I mean, how, how do you make good decisions if you don't have options, right? Yeah. So you have to start with, op you need options before you can make a good decision. Yeah. Some of us are privileged and have a lot of options and can make good decisions for ourselves, but not everyone has that. So again, it's an ongoing thing and it's this recognition that we, we Honestly, we have a moral duty to to make sure that people are taken care of. Yeah, I believe we do, and that's that's where we start. Um, that's where we start. Yeah. And I, I think Absolutely. I think that the child-free community, which I know this is not true for everyone, but for many of us, we have resources, we have time we can put our time and resources into things we believe in and we can do it as a body as a movement as a group of child free people who have decided that these things are important not just for us but for everyone and we can throw our time and resources at you know child free people do a lot of volunteer work a lot of volunteer work they give back in so many ways yeah and this is another way to do it yeah. i think that I would really like the very liberal, progressive, reproductive uh, healthcare justice organizations to recognize that that the gynecologists should all be open to doing voluntary sterilization, for example. Yeah, that should just be a thing. I know so much. Why, so much of it seems so. You just think it should just be as simple as this. Like, why is it so hard? Why is it so complicated? It seems like a natural progression and it seems like some of these things could be, well, why can't that happen? But as you said, there's just so many other factors that, are, that impact that, that just make it harder than what it needs to be. And that needs to change. Yeah, it, I think it needs to change. And I, and I do really believe that the child-free community, which is not a monolith, we all know that. However we can come together and make change. If it's not in the area of reproductive health care, maybe it's in the area of work-life balance, right? How many people have been putting in a lot of extra hours because they're covering for parents who are under some incredibly uh, harsh <laughs> pressures, um, working and homeschooling their kids, and how many women have had to leave the workforce because they felt they couldn't mm -hmm. deal with it? And how many of us have been asked to work extra hours to cover for that without extra pay, without extra time off? I hear about this all the time. Yeah. This is another thing that child-free people can come together on and say, we're, we're a voting block and yeah. we have time and resources. So we're going to... It's really interesting we that we're not seen as a... Um, a group as such like you even when you go to put hashtags and categories and stuff in different things and forms you have to fill out there is I, I remember trying to do some Facebook ads at one point and there was nothing that had 
anything that was targeted to child-free people. Like it was, right. there was parenting, there was all the, and I just went, this is such a massive group of people across the world. And I can't directly target them because they don't want me to. So it was, I just find that, that from, from a marketing perspective, from, you know, you can market to these child-free people who have, like, it just, it does my mind in that we're not, we're still not seen as a group of people that should be marketed to, you know, used in whatever way because they just don't recognise it. Whereas yeah. parents are marketed to constantly. They're constantly, a group, they're a parent group. But, but yeah. single yeah. women, single women weren't considered a powerful voting group until like Hillary Clinton ran for office. Yeah. So there is something that activates people, you yeah. know, and, and people take notice. Um, and I think that can happen, um, but not at the moment. But I think, I think yeah. again, the more... The more people who are doing work around child-free issues and are visible and can build communities, the more visible we can all become. Yeah, and exactly. I think the more we can do, yeah. really. Um, it's not. I remember I was talking to um, Amy Blackstone, who is just a brilliant person and um, has done brilliant work on child-free issues. And I, I asked her, I said, do you think this is a movement? Do you think there's a child-free movement? And she said, no, she didn't think so because we hadn't really found issues to gather around. For a movement, you have to have an issue and you have to organize around it. Mm. And we haven't quite done that yet, but I think we can. I think, um, right. I think we can organize. We can organize around issues and we can become a, a voting block and we can become a consumer block. Um, we can we can become uh, influential, Absolutely. and again, I keep coming back to this. I know that child free people are not all on their diamond yachts rolling around on yeah. hundred dollar yeah. bills. Yeah, obviously, but some of us, again, Wait, we have more time and we have more resources today. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, we can't like just like parents. There's all different demographics. We're all different. We have all different interests and hobbies, and there's yeah. a big generalization around that. But um, but yeah, I definitely think I think it's fantastic to see books being written, movies being made, groups being formed, conversations happening, conferences, all sorts of things around the topic, and people getting involved in that because it just brings visibility to what we're trying to say, mm -hmm. and hopefully it, we can change the dialogue and it can be a more positive one across the world. So, wouldn't it be so cool to organize around voluntary sterilization? Yeah. Wouldn't that be cool if child-free people could, could could come together? I'm not like really an organizer, but I know we have organizers out there to organize around the issue of how hard it is to get a voluntary sterilization. Yeah, it's, it's, and how shabbily people are yeah. treated. Yeah, and why is it different from men, from men can seem to get one so easily, but women? Right. It's a totally. And then there's an article in the magazine about that as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. They can buy the magazine and they can read all about it. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, why, why is it, why is it so hard? I mean, I have some ideas about why it's so hard, but, but again, we're, I meet child-free people all the time. There are a lot of us out there, yeah. a lot. And some people don't claim that as their identity and I get that. And you don't have to. Like, that's yeah. not my identity. I'm just, I'm a, I'm an accountant and I ski and I volunteer at the food pantry, right? That's, that's my identity. But again, I think, um, you know, single women, just as an example, were a group that were maligned, still are kind of maligned. When are you getting married? Why aren't you married? You know, mm. but something happened and they became a powerful force. And people recognized them as a powerful force in and of themselves and started catering to them. Yeah. So I think it would be very, very cool to, to, you know, to organize around a handful of issues that really impact our lives in, in profound ways um, yeah. that we could have an effect on. Most definitely. So, and there's plenty of us out there that can be part of that. There, there really are. Um, and yeah. So to answer all of your questions before, Let's organize. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's let's speak out. Not one Action. Facebook comment at a time, but yeah. in a much larger yeah. in a much larger way. Yeah, I mean this is this. Yeah. I mean 
this conversation I'm sure we could both have for hours because yes. there's so many different angles and topics and things we can dive deeper into, um, things that need to change, um, things that we can impact in positive ways. And unfortunately, we can't talk for hours. Um, <laughs> but, you know, thank you for, you know, writing the article. Thank you for being a voice in this area. I think it is a much needed voice in this area. I think there's probably more that all of us can do to get involved and to have more of a voice around it and to spread the word and do what we need to. Um, I'm certainly much more conscious of it because of the conversations that we've had over the last you know, year or two, because it probably wasn't as much on my radar. And I openly admit that until I was made more aware of it going, actually, yeah, I should be really more involved in this and, and, and be more vocal about it and so forth. And I think we can all do that. And these types of conversations help open that up. So if one more person does one more thing, that all has a you know a flow and effect and an impact. But thank you so much You're for so welcome. everything you do for um, you know being part of the magazine, for being part of the conversation, for, for you know for for trying to make change, um, and for what you're doing with the documentary. As I've mentioned, I'm so excited about it, and I can't wait to see it. And I think everyone should see it, parents and non-parents alike. So thank you. Um, stay fabulous. Keep doing what you're doing. It's great work. <laughs> you too. It's, you too. Um, yeah, but, but I love having these conversations with you. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Therese. Bye, everyone.